And now the Chair of National Women's Philanthropy, Wendy Abrams. Good morning. Her buildings command the Tel Aviv skyline, but there is so much more to the Azrieli name than impressive real estate. Theirs is a story of survival, the fight for freedom, and a lifelong commitment to helping others. She even hosted a group of endowed lions at this very GA. It is an honor to have her as a co-chair of this year's GA. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Donna Azrieli. <clears throat> My name is Dana Azrieli. I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and I moved to Israel uh, in 2000, 18 years ago. Uh, I'm second generation Holocaust survivor. It was always clear to me that I was going to make Aliyah, even as a young child. We were very Jewish traditionally and culturally. Uh, Friday night dinner, a must. Zionism was the culture, the image of the European um, brawny guy who's building the country was, were my heroes. I remember events in my house as a child, as a five-year-old, as a ten-year-old, where the motive was to raise money for Israel. And I remember once going up to the, the guy in charge and I like called him aside and I had gone upstairs to my, where I kept my money and I gave him the twenty dollars that I had. My father wasn't always a successful businessman. He always knew when he left Israel in 1950, that he was gonna come back. And he always knew that building this country was part of his dream. After my father passed away, I became the chairman of the Azrieli Group. The Azrieli Group is the largest real estate company in Israel, the seventh largest company on the Israeli Stock Exchange. We have 17 shopping malls, over 13 office buildings of well over 500,000 square meters. The Sarona Tower, the twisted building uh, in the center of Tel Aviv, and we've recently entered the senior housing market. This company is really a great example of how to build the country and how to put your money where your mouth is because the money that we earn, we can also be able to give. Part of the success of the Azrieli Group actually benefits our foundations. Our foundation in Canada, where my sister Naomi is the chairman, and our foundation in Israel, where I am the chairman along with my sister as co-chairman. So the Azrieli Foundation began in 98. Uh, our mission is to improve the lives of past, present, and future generations of Jewish people through education, research, healthcare, arts, and other types of giving. Tikkun olam. It's in our DNA. Judaism is about giving. I think that the relationship of needy Israel versus paternalistic North America is over. We need to give because we're a family and we support each other. You can have cousins all over the world that you didn't grow up with that you don't share a day-to-day -day culture with, but you're actually family. Please welcome co-chair of GA 2018, Dana Azrieli. Boker Tov. In many ways, I truly live at the nexus point between the two worlds represented here today. I was born in June 1967 in Montreal, Canada, on the eve of the Six Day War. My mother tells the story of how when she was giving birth, the radio was on and the doctor would be listening to the news from Israel between contractions. I grew up in a Jewish community bubble where I felt very safe and very Canadian, but where no Mishema records were playing in the background. The air of my childhood was filled not only with below zero temperatures, but with memories and stories of Zionist heroes. In my mind, I visualized and even envied the brawny, tall, tanned, muscled European men and women who moved to the swamplands of Palestine 
against all odds to build a country for our people. In a strange way, I always felt Israeli. I moved here 18 years ago at 32 years old to fulfill what seemed like the most obvious of my destinies. I emulated the earthy Jews who could navigate with a map and plow the fields, and I loved the fact that women here could be direct and strong and opinionated and yet motherly, loving, and yes, womanly and feminine. I have always been an ardent Zionist, and I have also always been a product of the liberal Northeast. I was educated in the US. I slept on the porch of the Swarthmore College President's House so we would divest from South Africa. And above all, I believe that one's right to express oneself is the ultimate freedom and that language must be fought with more language, but never censorship. When I see violence in the world, I feel despair. I can't understand how people murder. And even as a fully therapized child of a Holocaust survivor, I struggle with anxiety and fear that an enemy may lurk in a place I don't expect. I am always vigilant. I'm the graduate of a 95-day National Outdoor Leadership School Wilderness Training course just in case one day I will have to survive in a forest. And I hope that my overactive antenna that work over time, all the time, and have a deeply psychosomatic effect on my health <laughs> will save me if ever one day I am faced with an unexpected horror in a restaurant or a dance club. I have been within six meters of a terrorist running down the main street of the city where I live. I saw his knife. I saw his sweat. I heard the sirens because he had just stabbed a 70-year-old lady at the coffee shop on the corner. And I also saw the total abandonment of morality, the bestiality that overcame my Jewish neighbors when they ran the terrorist over with a car and hid his legs with a stick as he was face down at the bus stop while they were waiting for the police to arrive. I am a product of all of these things. Since 2014, I have been the chair of the Azraeli group. My father started the company in the 1980s. By that time, he was an established businessman in Canada, which was a far cry from his history as a Polish refugee who survived the war by running one step ahead of the Nazis and ending up through a series of adventures in Palestine in 1942. In 1950, he left Israel in search of relatives who, are, who had survived, who lived in South Africa and England. And by the way, in his search for these relatives, he was, for all intents and purpose, or purposes, a refugee. And there were those that accepted him and those that rejected him. And ultimately, he made his way to Canada. But when he left Israel, he always said he wanted to return. And then in the 1980s, he came here with the crazy dream of building the first shopping mall. It seems funny now, but in the 1980s, there was incredible inflation in Israel. And there was no culture of an enclosed mall space. There was no culture of renting a store instead of buying. There was no culture of getting financing against leases. 30 years later, Israel is a booming economy, successful beyond anyone's imagination. Every day, I get up and do my part to build our country. Every day, I work in Hebrew, which took me years to feel comfortable with, in a thriving business environment. But it is also an environment filled with military abbreviations, and where people disappear to do reserve duty for days or weeks at a time. One day, closing a deal seems like the most important thing on the agenda, and the next day, work takes second place to the commitment to protect our country. The business culture also includes gatherings which follow the Jewish calendar year. Every year, I get emotional when all of our employees meet up on the roof of the Israeli Center to celebrate the Jewish New Year. 
or by the absolute stop of all activity on Yom Kippur, or by the mournful ceremonies that take place on Memorial Day, which are followed by an almost natural transition into an incredibly joyous celebration for Independence Day throughout the country. Even more remarkable is that daily life in Israel stops on Tisha B'Av, when, remember, when we remember as a people the destruction of the first and second temples, stores closed, restaurants empty, in a ritual of remembering moments in our shared history that happened long before anyone was alive today, but which is still very much part of our cultural memory. All this and more is part of my experience of being in the two worlds represented here at the GA. Our worlds have so many similarities. The US and Israel are both democracies. We both have freedom of the press. We are both countries of immigrants who want to belong and who search for a better life. But we have many differences as well. In the US, our neighbors are Canada and Mexico. In Israel, our neighbors are Lebanon, Syria, Gaza, Jordan, and Egypt. In the US, there is an ongoing argument about healthcare. In Israel, healthcare is a given right for everyone. In the US, students incur incredible debt to get a university degree. In, the, in Israel, they pay a nominal fee. In the US, loose gun laws have led to terrible violence. In Israel, there are effective gun laws. On the other hand, in, US, in the US, marriage is governed by civil law. In Israel, it's governed by religious law. In the US, there is a core curriculum where any immigrant entering the public school system will get more or less the same education as any other American child in a public school. In Israel, there is no single core curriculum and there are profound differences to the curriculums taught in secular schools, national religious schools, Haredi schools, and Arab schools. We as Israelis have our share of extremely complicated issues. But 70 years ago, we were given a mandate to build the country, and we did. Within our country, we have developed our own slang, our own fashion, our own version of Saturday Night Live, our own pop culture, our own celebrities. The similarities and differences between our two worlds create disparate worldviews. We have come to this let's talk conversation about our future together from very different starting points. For example, how do we as North Americans begin to understand what we perceive as backward thinking when women are not allowed to pray at the wall? And yet, the Prime Minister reneged on the Sharansky Compromise due to the pressure exerted by religious extremists. As a North American, you are probably asking, how could he have done that? Some of you, and I know a few, might go even further and say, why should I support a country that does not support the way I practice my religion? But as an Israeli, I don't think the discourse is actually about the basic rights of women to pray as equal to men, or about the way we practice our religious freedoms. I think it is actually about a group of extreme people with political clout who truly believe that they must preserve our history with zeal. They think that if they do not protect our rituals of the past, that we are in danger of losing our tradition. Any change, any modern additions, they say, will lead to our demise. The religious extremists point to intermarriage in the diaspora and to the lack of Jewish knowledge in young people today. But in the diaspora, in North America, we fight back with reform and conservative Judaism. We try to encourage attendance in Jewish schools and Jewish camps. We have built birthright and Massah. But in secular Israel, these pluralistic trends have been very slow to take. The most common response by a secular Israeli is that they're better off with no religion, even though they often do many acts without acknowledging them as religious, like for example, almost every secular Israeli will fast on Yom Kippur. The secular Israeli still considers themselves Jewish, 
They still speak Hebrew, the language of our Bible, and most truly love our country. But it is not uncommon for a modern secular Israeli to say, just being Israeli is enough. Whole generation of Israelis have basically released their hold on our shared library of religious texts and heritage. My Australian husband, Danny, and I are raising our children in Israel. But a few years ago, my sister asked us to sing Adon Olam at her son's bar mitzvah. So I look at my two children who were in grade one and two at the time and were attending a secular Israeli public school, and I realized they don't know Adon Olam. My children learned the Don Olam from a YouTube channel while we were walking on the streets of Toronto two days before the bar mitzvah. On that day, my husband and I made the decision to move from our very secular Israeli environment to a community where the pluralistic school, the Tali school, similar to how I grew up, but unfortunately not very prevalent in Israel today, where our children would be exposed to Judaism and like-minded families. Now, in addition, we send our kids back to North America every summer to attend summer camp at Camp Ramah, where... <laughs> there, the kids learn Birkat Amazon, and they're exposed to the Yiddishkeit that it takes a village to convey, a village filled with customs and rituals that my Zionist heroes, the ones who built this country, they gave up upon them in favor of a culture that focused on the importance of building the land, of being strong. Our new culture was no longer tied to being victims of the past. It was no longer tied to the rituals that preserved our identity when we were visitors in another people's land, when we were minorities. And so many Israelis grew up feeling that just being Israeli is enough. But as an Israeli, I think just being here is not enough. There needs to be more. And so what is my message today? As today's world is becoming more extreme, as people are becoming more closed and protectionist, we, the Jewish people of the world, do not have the privilege or the luxury of becoming protectionist from each other. Since I come from the real estate world, I'm going to use an image of an arch. An arch is two sides pressing together. North American Jewry and Israeli Jewry are like two sides of an arch. We need each other. We need to push against each other to stay strong. By leaning into each other, by providing each other with the right amount of resistance and the right amount of support, we will have the strength to withstand the pressure from all sides but one side of an arch cannot stand without the other. <laughs> to take my analogy further, the two sides of our arch are composed of different things. We have different elements on each side, some which give strength and some which create weakness. The art is to find the right amount of resistance, the right amount of pressure, and the right amount of dependence and independence to ensure that our two sides will always remain strong vis-a-vis -vis one another. So as you think about the metaphor of the arch and the composition and the pressure, think about the composition of Israeli society today through this small story. Israel today is less than 50% Ashkenazi. So many of us come from Yemen and Morocco, Iraq and Iran and Ethiopia. Recently, I was at a ceremony for the Junior Maccabiah, where I watched teenagers from all over the globe proudly walking on stage, holding their respective countries' flags, Jewish kids coming from all over the world to meet and compete with other Jewish kids on the great level playing field of the sports stadium. Anyways, it was very exciting, and at the end of the ceremony, the Israeli organizers thought they would surprise everyone, and they brought the biggest Israeli pop band as a, as a, on stage as a surprise. Now it's a band led by these two guys, one named Static and one named Ben El. So Static and Ben El come bouncing onto the stage, super excited. The Israelis are totally into it. The other kids are looking on curiously, kind of getting into the beat. They don't understand the words. And then this guy that was sitting next to me, a donor from New York, he leans over and he asks me, 
are these guys Jewish? Are these guys Jewish? Because the cool Israeli rock stars were not who he expected. They were Mizrahi Jews, and the music had a Mizrahi sound. Today, many North Americans don't realize that Israel society is incredibly diverse. Similar to North America, Israel is an immigrant society with incredibly ethnically diverse Jewish cultures. This Jewishly diverse Israel is exactly what our Zionist dream intended. When we built this country, our immigrant mentality tried to push us to belong. Just like those of you whose grandparents immigrated to America, as immigrants to any country, we learn the language, we change the way we dress. But this next generation, the generation that we're here at the GA to talk about, they're native Israelis and native North Americans. They're no longer immigrants. This next generation has the benefits and the burdens of a people who actually feel like they belong. The benefit is that we're thriving in our respective communities, but the burden is that we've forgotten what it's like to be other, and so we forget that we need each other. But we are two sides of an arch, two sides that are stronger when placed together, and we have layers and layers of success and failure, inclusion and exclusion, protectionism and universalism, moments of great fairness and moments of terrible close-mindedness, moments of great heroism and moments of bestiality. We love our countries, but we criticize them. We love America, but we don't give up when we disagree with our leaders. As I know you love Israel, we must never give up on our commitment to the country when we disagree with its policies or leaders. We must never give up our mutual bond which keeps each other strong. So to conclude, it's not just the settlements. It's not just religious extremism. It's not just women at the wall. It's not just the nation state law. In addition, it's not just who is serving in the army. It's not just who's paying taxes in Israel. And it's not just about who pays the price of living where you're afraid for your security. Our shared story is so much more complicated than that. Don't give up on our country. Don't walk away because your liberal sensibilities are insulted. Don't assume that nothing can change. Things do change, just painfully, slowly, incrementally, and with all of our help. Help by continuing the dialogue, but not by oversimplifying it. Help by infusing your children with a love of our heritage that celebrates the good. I am not suggesting that we ignore the things we disagree with. I am simply suggesting that we remember it's a marathon, not a sprint. And the strength of Israel today is an equal force leaning into the counter strength of Jews throughout the world. Thank you.